Welcome to the special edition of Value for Money TV show, a six-week special feature put together by Paradigm Leadership Support Initiative, PLSI, through its Value for Money advocacy project, supported by the European Union Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Rulac program. The objective of this show is to discuss key accountability issues relating to public finance management in Nigeria. And over the next six weeks, we will be discussing delivery of social services to marginalized and underserved communities, converse on management and utilization of extractive revenue collected by government entities from international oil companies, as well as deliberate on issues around inefficiency in tax collection remittance and its effect on budget implementation. My name is Olusegun Elemo, your anchor on the show. We take a break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. This is the maiden edition of Value for Money TV show. And today we're discussing accountability issues around delivery of social services to Nigerians. Nigeria's President Muhammad Buhari on Tuesday, 19th November 2019, said one trillion naira had been spent on constituency projects in 10 years with no direct bearing on the lives of Nigerians. It is on record that in the past 10 years, I'm quoting the president now, it is on record that in the past 10 years, one trillion naira had been appropriated for constituency projects, yet the impact of such huge spending on the lives and welfare of ordinary Nigerians can hardly be seen. Is this problem peculiar to constituency projects or common to how capital portion of annual budget is implemented? Paradigm Leadership Support Initiative, PLSI, through its Value for Money Advocacy Project, monitored 30 audited development projects captured in the 2016 audit report of the Federation and located across 12 states of the Federation, including Adamawa, Kano, Enugu, Lagos, Oyokwara, and Ogun states. While a total of 2.97 billion naira is yet to be accounted for, as National Assembly through its public account committees is just about commencing review of 2015 and 2016 audit report of the Federation, many of these projects, though constituency, are either abandoned, not executed, or poorly implemented. This problem is one that has impacted and still impacting negatively on the quality of life of citizens in underserved and marginalized communities. The unabated trend continues to raise question on the effectiveness, efficiency, and economy of public spending, as well as the performance of the country's annual budget. Joining me to discuss this and more are Michael Agoro, Head of Financial Investigation Unit, Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC. Thank you for joining us on the show. You're welcome. I also have in the studio, Pristine Obada, uh, is a state lead for Connected Development Co. Thank you for joining us. It's great. I have in the studio as well, uh, Aremu Usman, Vice President, Malete Community Development Association, Kwara State. Thank you for joining us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Hello, viewers. Thank you. So, uh, so I go to you, uh, Michael. I mean, uh, I know ICPC is doing quite uh, a number of things around how constituency projects are implemented, uh, but you heard the opening remark that I you know, uh, I spoke about 2.97 billion not accounted for on 30 critical projects to provide water, education facility, and road infrastructure in 12 states of the Federation, as detailed by the Auditor General of the Federation uh, in the 2016 audit report. The federal government comes, you know, often to say the projects are performing. And I believe they are talking about releases of funds to MDAs. So the question is, with what ICPC is doing right now, I, I don't think the projects are performing, are they? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, before I give you an answer, I'd like to uh, introduce a perspective into your discussion. There is a review carried out by the Shattered Institute of Project Management of Nigeria, uh, as reported by African Exponent in May 2019. In that survey, it was discovered that about 12 trillion worth of projects are abandoned across the face of the Federation. And the director of administration of that institute said that 
approximately 56,000 on project leads in the whole country. Wow. So you can see that uh, these revolutions and what's revolutions said in the introduction. They're in tandem. They are really mind boggling. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the question again is are the national budgets performing? I mean, vis a vis what you just mentioned. Well, if we are to look at the area of releasing of funds, if we are to uh, appraise the national budget on fund being released, we will say the budgets are performing. But the vital question that we need to ask ourselves is those implementing the budgets, are they creating value for money? Or is the money going, is being diverted, misappropriated, or used for other purposes? I think that should be the basis of our discussion today. And if you notice, the Commission recent conducted what we call the CPTG, uh, that's tracking of a constituency project. From 12 states and just 370 projects that were visited, we noticed that about uh, five projects were abandoned, ab initio, and 34 other contractors mobilized the site as a result of the project. That shows that about 39 out of just 370 projects, which is more than 10% were abandoned. So if projects by lawmakers can be abandoned, what about projects that are from other sectors of the community? So that shows that the problem is really a big one. Yeah, now I, I go to Princeton. Uh, I mean, your organization, Connected Development, uh, has uh, an advocacy project, Follow the Money. Uh, and I, I know you also uh, track public spending uh, in, 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 in rural communities. Correct. I mean, could you share a bit of your experiences with us? Well, um, I think that generally, if you, if, you look at, if you look at budget performance, um, there are multi, multiple sectors when it comes to the budget, but particularly for us, we look at capital projects. And over the last seven years of our organization's existence, we have, we have been across over 300 communities um, in the country. And one of the key things that we, we see is that in relation to the realities of the people, the budget is not performing. And I, I, I mean, poverty is at its highest now. You have over 47% you know, of, of the population living in abject poverty, living below the poverty index. This just shows you that our budget and the ways that we, we invest our, 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 our spendings as yeah. a country, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not proper. Channels have sectors that are supposed to receive better funding, take for yep. example education, take for example healthcare, yes. are, 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 are receiving less. Okay. And even when the funding comes, there's a problem with implementation. Okay, now from what you have seen on the ground in terms of monitoring implementation of this project, I mean, previous annual budget, what exactly can you say? Uh, are we seeing some, tr some track record of increased implementation, effective implementation, or what exactly could you say? Well, I, I, I would say that what we have seen is because information is, is a big, there's a big divide between communities where this project is supposed to be implemented, right? And the implementing, the implementing agencies. Now, if communities do not have access to information, anything can go on in these communities. Most of the communities that we have worked in, we have seen that they do not even get what they're supposed to get. Projects have been abandoned increasingly okay. in the, from 2015 till now. Okay. Increasingly, we have seen that projects have been abandoned. And sometimes this, the implementing agencies do not, even, they do not even respond when you ask for questions about why projects are being abandoned, about you know, the figures around this project implementation, who, who um, is carrying out this contract. Exactly. Now, uh, I, I, before I go to uh, 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 Usman, I think I want to come back to, to Michael once more. Uh, and I want to speak to facts now. Uh, there is a project that was awarded uh, in Kano State. It's called Construction of 21.26 Kilometer Single Carriageway in Tamawagulu uh, in Kano State. The project was awarded 
uh, on contract number 6273 was awarded to a company at 936.1 nine, nine, million naira in 2015. I mean, we, we saw this project, we visited the site, the project is abandoned. And the Surgeon General said about 140.4 million naira was not accounted for. What, what can you say is responsible for this, this kind of behavior uh, by contractors? I mean, from what you've seen with the CPTG? Well, we look at this um, issue from the angle of corruption. When there's corruption in the system, projects are bound to fail the way they are failing today. Because um, sometimes before a contractor is mobilized to site, the awarding official demands for 10%, 20%. I mean, is that a fact? Thereabouts. We know it. The 10% factor is known widely in Nigeria. Okay. Though it's not on paper, it's not on record, but it's something that happened. And once this has been done from the, the inception of the project, then we are sure that the project is bound to fail. It's bound to fail. Because the contractor we look at the project, it cannot break even, it cannot make a profit, so what does it do? It takes his own share of the money and abandons the project. Wow. Uh, Usman, so uh, I know <coughs> you have some abandoned projects in your community. There is uh, a water project that is abandoned, as well as uh, the construction of a bridge. Yes. Uh, can you speak to some of these issues and how it's affecting the Maliti community? Thank you very much. I want to thank my community for allowing me to represent them in this uh, uh, forum. And uh, on behalf of my community, I um, uh, ask to convey their profound gratitude to Paradigm Leadership Support Initiative for creating a conducive awareness for we in the community. Because if not for that, we wouldn't have known that there is any project going on in our own community. So thank you very much. Then, uh, actually, two projects from the federal are ongoing or has been uh, established or uh, said to be in place in my own community. The first one is uh, Apodu Water Dam which I've uh, earlier granted an uh, uh, interview to China TV that this particular dam was established during Murtala regime. The community only benefited from this uh, uh, water project for just two years before it collapsed. And going around as of that time, you can see the level of uh, the, the situation with the water was then it was that same project that was awarded for about one billion. Points, one yeah, just to really to expand and you know one billion in 2015. One point zero two one billion billion in 2015. Yes, yeah. Sir. It was a collective project by all the lawmakers in the state. Exactly. So, actually, the uh, reawarding of the projects came about as a result of uh, giving us Kwara State University Malete. Before, uh, initially, the population of Maliti is less than 10,000. But as of now, we are running to about 30,000. Wow. And the, uh, the only tank that supplies the town is just 5,000 5, liter tank, supplying 30,000 people. habiting people, the students, the staff of the Kwara University, the uh, those that comes from other villages to to reside, cells and go back, then the villagers themselves. So that means each individual will have less than one liter per day to use. Wow. So, in fact, you want the government to come to our aid on this. Then the second project was on a uh, Wero Bridge. Actually, I want to sketch. A map, maybe the uh, the engineer that uh, that was you know call call upon to you know actually map up map map out things how this bridge should be constructed 
did a very wrong uh, calculation. A river that is coming like this, then break into two. Hmm? Then when a, uh, an engineer was called to make bridge across something of this nature, he's supposed to come here and make the bridge here. But instead, being that this one is bigger than this river, he now make the bridge here and have to force vehicles that have been able to cross this to go inside water for coming out. So presently now, no vehicle can cross this. the river. Yes. Even despite the, the present project being made on this particular river, it cannot, the, the bridge is too has, small. Has the contractor returned to site ever since? It was For where? No. What about the water project? The project, well, those, the contractor are there in Malite. I've almost spoke with them when I was coming that why is it that it's only 10% of Malite and uh, the area you're supposed to cover in Malite is only 10% you have covered. They are not saying that they are doing it face by face. Oh, the contractors have now returned? They are there. Wow. They are there. But maybe they are just buying time. I don't know. Now, Christian, uh, you, you just heard Usman spoke about the experience of, of his community. Would you say this are some of the reasons why we have the high level of poverty and inequality? I, I, I would... I would concur with your statement. Um, the truth is, envir en there are environmental factors that determine if people become successful, if people's livelihoods are improved. Now, he just, he just gave us um, a brief summary of what his community is experiencing. Yeah. Now, if people cannot move from point A to point B, how are they going to um, provide their goods and services? How do you expect basic amenities to reach them? Exactly. Now, they have primary health care centers. How do you expect drugs to get there? Mm. People cannot pass, obviously, because th there's no bridge. Yeah. Now, this is just one scenario. What about other scenarios whereby communities are cut off totally? And I mean, this is a partial cut off. Because as of now, you have high levels of water. And if there, there are high levels of water, it means people can only stop by the bridge and look at their communities, but they can't get there. Yeah. Or they will get there through ferries or boats. Exactly. So I strongly believe you know, that the high, the high level of poverty is because the people are, the, the governments and the kinds of projects that we invest our funding, taxpayers' monies actually, yes. into, are not efficient. They are not efficiently implemented. Okay. And if they are not efficiently implemented, it means that poverty will thrive because mm. poverty has a socio-economic factor. Certainly. I mean, on that, on that, it was is on that note. Now, I want Michael to quickly intervene. Uh, Princeton just said projects are not efficiently implemented. What should ICPC be doing to? prevent this from happening in the first place. I mean, the laudable projects uh, on the CPTG is fine. We're trying to recover funds now, and, and SEPC said it has recovered some money, as well as some uh, 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 equipment. But how do we even protect public funds, taxpayers' money, like Kristen said, from even uh, you know, getting into corrupt hands in the first place? I think first and foremost, the country needs to declare an emergency on the project. <laughs> um, this will require. I think I agree with that. I agree with yeah. you. And this will require the law enforcement, the anti-corruption agencies, to partner with the those who conducted that research, and also work with the Ministry of Finance and the Office of the Accountant General, so that we can identify and X-ray those contractors who monies have been given to and they have their projects. Yeah. I will look at the value of what is on ground and the money they have received. Yeah. If they have diverted government money, they should be arrested, prosecuted, and even their private properties should be recovered to replace what they have um, taken away from the system. Mm -hmm. This will send a strong signal to official contractors that it is not business as usual. If you divert our project, you go away with the money, the anti-corruption agencies will come after you and your own properties that you've uh, acquired even before the project 
might uh, suffer might suffer loss from them. So this, I think, can also help to to reduce the spate of uh, abandoned uh, projects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to also add to what he has said, you know, I'm glad that we are speaking about constituency projects. Now, if 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 we look at constituency projects, it means that they are elected representatives that are nominating for these projects to be carried out in their communities. Yeah. Now, in a country where even elected representatives do not represent their people's interests, some of them do not even have offices within their constituencies. Some of them, they, the offices that they have, you can never reach them. Constituency funds are never reached. It means that the needs of the people is barely represented. And it takes us again back to the needs assessment issue. Whether this assessments are actually carried out by the lawmakers who nominate consensus projects or by ministries, partners and agencies who uh, envision capital projects in the budget. True. I, so, would, I would also say here that, I mean, most of the, if, if, if we dig deep into some of the people being awarded projects, you find out that the lawmakers actually own some of these companies. I mean, they have interest. They have interest. So they nominate projects out of vested interest and exactly. not the interest of their community. Now, what exactly should ordinary citizens, do they have a role to play in ensuring public accountability, in ensuring value for money, for instance? Do they have a role? And what, what, what would that role be? I, I, I would say that the role of the citizen is the most, in, most important role in all of this. Uh, but but they often say there's little they can do in... That is because information, there's, there's that information gap. Hmm. Awareness. And, and, and if, if, if there we, we create enough information for the people to feed on, that, that's empowerment. Exactly. If we give people information, now we're speaking of all of these projects, we're calling all of these large numbers and, and having this discussion here. But I tell you, less than 20% of community members actually know of this project yes. existence. And a larger number of the 20% are even the elites. Some exactly. of them are living in the cities yep. and not in the communities where these projects are supposed to be carried out. Right. So the role of the citizen is engaging with their lawmakers. And if your lawmakers are not representing you, I think that it's about it's high time that we begin to call for impeachment. We should recall elected representatives. And the power of this is in the hands of the citizens. That's yet to be tested anyway. But Michael, uh, I mean, when you review issues, I know, and I know you, you've, you've, you've done this at the ICPC, uh, so you realize that there is abuse of financial regulations. I mean, we have laws. Uh, there is abuse of uh, procurement laws, for instance. And you wonder what exactly is the Bureau for Public Procurement doing? I mean, why should we have such easy ride around procurement laws where it's easy for whether public officials in collaboration with contractors to abuse procurement laws? For instance, uh, there are laws that say that a contractor must not be paid beyond a particular threshold of implementation. But you often see that in the Auditor General's report where cases where contractors receive monies beyond what they have done on the ground. <coughs> Why is it that easy? Uh, well, I would not. Um, uh, I would like to make a case on behalf of the BBP because number one, they do not have enforcement powers, so it's easy for contractors to uh, maneuver take matters with uh, levity. However, we want to view this as a Nigerian project. Therefore, if any contractor or any interested party do away with government funding. It is at this point that we're talking about the awareness campaign by the community. Exactly. In fact, the community should start community policing of projects. Mm. So that if wow. they policing these projects and the projects are not being implemented as intended. More like a citizen auditors. Yes, they should not report because the law enforcement agencies cannot be in all communities at the same time. Even when we started the CPTG project, project, we could not go around the whole country. We have to choose first states and some particular projects in some sectors. So that means that there are other states, other sectors, other projects. That could not be reached. Mm -hmm. So if the people should own these projects and the demand for quality service, then we will have a, a solution to this uh, problem. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's on that note that we draw the curtain.
uh, today on the Value for Money show. Uh, I've been speaking uh, with Michael Agbo, the financial, uh, the head financial investigation unit it's been a pleasure. Uh, of uh, uh, the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I've also been speaking with Pristin Obad on the State Lead for Connected Development Code. Thank you for your intervention on the program today. Uh, uh, finally, I've been speaking with Aremu Usman, the Vice President, Malete Community Development Association from Kwara State. Thank you uh, for coming on the show. Asalaam. Thank you very much. Yeah. Value for Money is a project of Paradigm Leadership Support Initiative, PLSI. It is supported by the European Union Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Rollout Program. Till we come your way again next time, always remember that public accountability is possible only with a vigilant and involved citizenry. I remain yours sincerely, Olusha Gwelemo. Thank you for being part of the program today. See you next time. God bless Nigeria. Thank you.